<gasps> yes, it's working. Okay. Check. Oh, I don't know if this is. Can you hear me? Jesus Christ, I'm like a grandma. Okay. I've hooked up this microphone. I'm hoping you can hear me. If you can't, I just won't save this and we'll try it again. I'm going to assume that you can. Um, so it's me, Faith Yen, an actual second gen Mooney. And I thought a really cool idea would be to do a trend that I've been seeing on leftist Twitter and YouTube channels, which is just reading <laughs> to everyone. Um, usually on like leftist Twitter, it's reading socialist and communist and anarchist theory, but I thought it would be super meta and super hilarious to see an actual recently escaped second gen Mooney who wears blue and has a rose tattoo reading out of a book about Moonies that is blue and has a rose on it. Um, it's called Heavenly Deception by Maggie Brooks. So Heavenly Deception, Deception is something that I was taught to do and that a lot of us were literally taught to do in the Moonies. Um, it's basically where your church leader tells you to lie to people for the sake of the movement. Um, <laughs> like when people ask you what they're giving you money for, you're supposed to say it's for a mission trip to Africa, even if it's just to give to Reverend Moon or to get you some food to eat. Um, I don't know how long this video is going to be. I just want to read it chapter by chapter. I was thinking this could be a series. Like each live, I'll just read another chapter. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited. So Maggie Brooks is the very British author. Um, so I guess to write this book, she went to a Mooney recruiting workshop and lived with Moonies for about two weeks to get research for this book and ended up leaving earlier than anticipated because she could feel herself getting indoctrinated. Um, the, uh, there's some really intense um, praise or like reviews on the back. Um, so from the observer, for example, the author certainly makes you feel the Moonies methods of insidious brain intruding power her nightmare has orwellian shape and awfulness um <laughs> from the daily telegraph the sinister mind-bending practiced by the moonies is a serious subject and miss brooks writes about it with a compelling crusading energy that makes for a convincing disturbing and valuable novel it's just like i love seeing what people have to say about the cult that i was born and raised in like I'm over here reading it from the other side. This was me. I was at these workshops indoctrinating people, not this exact one um, in England that she went to. Um, I think it's set in England. Um, also, as we get into this, I just want to let you know, um, I've only really been out of the Moonies for a year. I'm still taking EMDR sessions once a week. Uh, I still get triggered every day. Um, I'm looking into getting a therapy animal. Um, and what's scary about doing lives is I can't edit out all the times I stutter and dissociate and uh, <laughs> freak out a little bit. I'm also that bitch who uh, adds her own comments from the peanut gallery during movies. So that's what you're getting. Not only is this going to be a very unprofessional audiobook, you're going to hear my commentary as, as a former Mooney who is still learning to change her vocabulary words and separate her identity from this cult. Um, you're going to hear me making ridiculous comments because I can't help myself. I am that friend who can't shut up during the movie. Ooh, ow. Okay, so let's get into this. <clears throat> Heavenly Deception. A powerful, compelling, even shocking novel which draws the reader deeply into the experience of religious mind-bending and personal discovery or betrayal. <laughs> With tremendous energy, suspense, and frighteningly persuasive narrative skill, 
Heavenly Deception is, at bottom, a simple, even common story. Carmen, a young woman in search of her missing sister, follows up on a stray lead and enters into the closed world of the enigmatic religious cult of the Unification Church. As she enters this new realm, the story becomes increasingly complex and Kafkaesque in its convincing, disturbing tension. Keeping her real motive a secret, Carmen is inducted into this society of ever smiling. Not me smiling while reading this. Ever smiling, singing Moonies with strangely vacant eyes. And by a week's end, she is raging, confused, exhausted, and suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Is this indeed a dream of perfect love, or is it a sinister manipulation? Can the cult's chilling ambition to convert the whole world be realized? By the time Carmen finds her sister, the force of the Moonies' reality has caused her sense of the outside world to waver, and Carmen must battle to preserve her own identity. Dun, dun, dun. All right, let's get into this shit. <clears throat> Just think of it as me being someone who lives with you in your cabin during quarantine. And this is what we do to pass the time. Like hometown on the prairie or little women. <laughs> <clears throat> or pretend you're in a cult with me and we don't have cell phones or TV. That's pretty much what we did too. Okay. Chapter one. Finally, the coach scrunched up a long driveway and into the grounds of a large Victorian house. The doors side open and the passengers poured out onto the gravel forecourt, shaking the crap cramp out of their legs, shaking the crap out of their legs, <laughs> shaking the cramp out of their legs, looking around them with the air of slightly dazed sheep. Carmen took in her surroundings carefully. The house was solid and dignified like a rectory. It was screened and shielded by tall trees and the shrubbery was tended and luxuriant. Rhododendron flowers ballooned pink fr from their lush green foliage against banks of larkspur and regulated hollyhocks. The fuck is a hollyhock? This woman is so British. Got me saying shit like hollyhocks. Regulated hollyhocks. There was a feeling of wealth, of care, and respectability. Yeah, the church owns lots of massive properties, so that doesn't surprise me. Carmen had spent must, much of the long journey trying to decide which of her fellow travelers were guests and which were members. Now the members made themselves conspicuous by the purposeful way they were heaving the baggage out of the hold and ferrying the luggage towards the oaken doors, shivying their charges to follow. The sound of joyful singing drifted out on the fragrant summer air. Carmen tagged onto the line of the other guests as they trotted obediently behind the members into the vestibule. <laughs> Fucking vestibule. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. Oh no, now I lost my spot. Okay, they watched as their luggage was piled into a mountain. She stood slightly apart from the others, aimless and ill at ease, listening to the full-throated gospel song, taking in the portentous gloom of the dark oak paneling, the warm light that filtered through the stained glass bird vignettes around the door, casting bright shadows on the stone flag floor. This way, someone said, and the guests shambled awkwardly after their leader toward the rapturous singing that was swelling from the hall down the corridor. Carmen hovered in the doorway, unable to get right inside the hall because it was so crowded. The room was laid out with neat rows of scrubbed deal trestle tables. Maybe 60 people, a mixed bunch, a cross-section of races and ages, were singing down by the riverside. I'm sorry, I just need to have a few flashbacks. Oh no, oh no. We're going to describe a song session. Oh, you can do a bitch. Okay. <laughs> We're sinking down by the riverside with every ounce of their strength and lung power. Swaying ecstatically to the sound they were producing. The room was dominated by a handwritten songboard and all eyes were pinned upon it. The sun's departing rays lent a bronze light to their ardent faces, and Carmen looked around in wonderment, feeling the power that was pent up in their ardor. To either side of the song sheet, a clean-cut boy in a checkered shirt played guitar. I could name, like, five people 
fit that description my whole life. And another man was beating out the rhythm on a set of tablas. I'm assuming tablas is a type of drums. Yeah, I know it is for sure. They were smiling, kind of like I've been this whole live stream because it's a self-defense mechanism. Practically everyone in the room was smiling. In sympathy, a rather nervous simper settled experimentally on her face. Oh, I looked up the word simper and it's like a... a and not genuine smile. Um, as the song came to an end, everybody clapped and began to cheer and whistle until the noise threatened to raise the roof. It was then that she became aware of Gary at her shoulder. He was smiling too. He guided her gently through the crowd just as if I had a hammer was starting up. If this, if she mentions Grace of the Holy Garden at any point in this book, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. <laughs> They began to sing it at full throttle, complete with actions. Mm -hmm. That's why I can't stop doing hand motions in any of my lives on Instagram or YouTube. I always have to talk with my hands. Uh, the hammer, the warning telltale finger, the crossed heart for love, <laughs> and extended arms to encompass the universe. Oh, <laughs> Gary was singing heartily with a good, clear baritone, and he nodded at her encouragingly and motioned her to sing along. She piped up reluctantly in a muffled mumble, and then he firmly put her hands together and encouraged her to copy the actions. She began to wag her finger with a singular lack of conviction. So song sessions, first of all, we did them all the time. And second, the best way to gauge who's committed and who's wavering and who needs to brainwash more, who needs to be brainwashed more is to have a song session. Cause it's, it's, it's incredibly easy to see who's like half-assing it and who's committed. Like during a song session, you have to be singing, even if you're tone deaf, like you have to be projecting, you have to be clapping and using your whole body. You have to have your eye contact. Like, if you don't want to be singing, it's obvious in your body language. So just like this dude, Gary, was suddenly at her shoulder because she wasn't singing and she was half-assing it. And they said that he, she said that he started putting her hands together for her. That's exactly what the fuck these, I don't know if I can swear. Yes, I can. I can swear on YouTube. That's exactly what the fuck these song sessions are for. So you can see who's like not really with it. And then through like body language, and like peer pressure through body language, you can get them to fully participate and be present in the moment rather than keeping their identity safe by not participating. The goal is to get them to act like everyone else and talk like everyone else. Um, as she sang, her eyes roved across the unfamiliar lit up faces, half hoping to pinpoint Lucy in, her, in their midst. She couldn't really tie in this sort of thing with Lucy. It made no sense. But then had any of it made sense? An idle thought occurred to her and she bit her lip to suppress it. It would be extremely ironic if she's picked the wrong cult. What if Lucy was wrapped up in a sari tagging after a string of bald men with bongos in Lower Regent Street? Since Lucy had not headed her pathetic little letter or named any particular group, there had been very little to go on. It was a process of slim research, elimination, and half hunches that had led Carmen here. Yeah, actually, there were a ton of cults active at the time. Um, so the Moonies for a while blended right in with like the Hare Krishnas, bunch of other shit. I don't know, man. Um, whether it made sense or not, she was almost sure that she was in the right place. When they'd sung themselves to a standstill, the tablet player stood up and grinning bro broadly, waited for the applause to die away. He was a handsome man of around 30 wearing a neat gray suit. They're always so pretty looking. Every Mooney, that's how they recruit you. <laughs> they just flirt, <laughs> make you think you're going to get laid or go on a date. Psych! <laughs> you're going to take a pledge of chastity. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. He was a handsome man of around 30 wearing a neat gray suit. He had startling blue eyes and an air of quiet authority. <laughs> I feel called out. <laughs> he introduced himself as Matthew, the leader of the center, and he began a warm speech of welcome to the newcomers. 
Carmen's eyes continued to roam restlessly over faces as she tried to discern the ratio of guests to members. The members, she decided, were somehow cleaner. The girls hung on his every word, their eager faces shining like scrubbed apples, and the boys had close-cut hair and poker backs. Makes sense, because you can't show that you're tired. You gotta, like, look crisp, or you'll get talked to. Over the door was an ori- Okay, this book is dated because they use the word oriental. That's rude, but I'm just reading what it says. Over the door was an oriental insignia formed of wriggly sun rays that seems seemed at odds with the austere vicarage ambiance. Um, did it look something like that? Is that is that what it looked like? Was maybe? Hmm. Did it did it look like this? <laughs> Mayhaps. Interesting. <laughs> I guess some of you are looking around you. Matthew boomed in a faintly transatlantic version of an Oxbridge accent, thinking weird. <laughs> Everybody laughed. The members laughed inordinately, fondly, as though on a cue. And the guests laughed because they were already wondering what they were doing here this lazy Sunday afternoon and how they had allowed themselves to be persuaded to climb aboard the coach. What a weird bunch of people, huh? How come they get such a kick from just singing together? <laughs> you always got to ask these like rhetorical questions and overturn objections before they happen. People from like pyramid schemes and L MLM groups do this too. Very good public speaking techniques. You say their thoughts before they can say it. You eliminate their objection before they can use it to leave. He paced up and down with a benevolent smile on his face. But you know, there's something you'll find out pretty soon here. We all get an enormous kick out of being here together, living as a family. A family made up of all ages, races, and colors. A family made up of all different religions. It sounds like some sort of miracle, doesn't it? He let his smile fade and his face became somber. A multiracial family, working together, caring for one another. A family based on love. That surely does sound like a miracle. He shook his head sadly. Well, it's a miracle we want to share with you. All we ask is that you put your preconceptions away and travel along with us for seven days. Accept our hospitality, enjoy our entertainment, and look at the way we live. That's all we ask. Um, Asterisk, side note, it only takes three days of full-time um, indoctrination to change a person's brainwave pattern and their script about themselves. Food for thought. Um, he grinned boyishly at the clumps of visitors around the room. Is that a lot to ask? There were murmurs of no from all four corners. Audience participation. Got to get them involved. Sometimes people think we have some religious acts to grind, they say. <clears throat> this family of yours, sure, it's great, but it's nothing to do with me. I'm an atheist, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Muslim. Well, I just want to tell you now, we don't care what you are. To us, your brothers and sisters, coming here to see a unique and amazing experiment, living proof that the world can live as one. That's a line from a Beatles song that we also sang all the time, that the world can live as one. And what's interesting is when you do these song sessions for decades, uh, multiple times a week, you end up like using lyrics from songs in your everyday vernacular. I just pointing that out <clears throat> and the world can live as one. <laughs> and perhaps you'll find something very true here, something very profound and moving. You may experience some deep internal revelation as each of us here in the family has done. Carmen found herself looking speculatively at the girls with their hair scraped back from their faces and hidden under peasant kerchiefs. Okay, handkerchiefs, headbands. At Gary, staring reverently ahead of him, his face taut with concentration. What had they found here? So we're setting out on a voyage of discovery. It could be a pretty exciting time, huh? They laughed again and there seemed something unnatural, something too automatic about their response. Yeah, because you literally get rewarded for participating. You get rewarded for being more able type in the staff meetings that this author may never be privy to. Yes. It's like being at any other Christian church, I suppose. 
Um, they laughed again and there seemed something unnatural, something too automatic about their response. They laughed like a studio audience. We're all traveling light here. All we ask you to bring is a toothbrush and an open mind. The room erupted into wild applause and Matthew had to shout above the noise. If anyone's forgotten their toothbrush, don't worry, the house mothers got some spares. And that produced even more hilarity and a renewed volley of tumultuous clapping. Carmen felt a little left behind. The wild delight was quite out of proportion to the content of the speech, and she wasn't used to unalloyed enthusiasm applied so indiscriminately. Not going to lie, I still do that. I'm still, like, disproportionately excited about everything, and it weirds people out, and I don't know how to turn it off. I guess just being raised in this environment makes you, like, a puppy dog of a person. Wow. This is some <laughs> I feel like this is exposure therapy therapy. <laughs> like, uh, uh, she was aware of a rather contemptuous curl to her upper lip, and she suddenly felt a twinge of guilt about it. Had he really said anything to sneer about? Was there anything wrong with the notion of racial harmony, of brotherly love? It was churlish to prejudge them in the circumstances. They'd laid on transport and a meal. She'd paid her 12 pound check, it was true, but then 12 pounds wouldn't go far to cover a whole week's food and accommodation. And everyone seemed very gentle and kind. She supposed until she could see a reason to doubt their sincerity, it was only fair to keep an open mind. So already she's talking herself out of her gut instinct because intellectually they haven't said anything wrong yet right? Intellectually, they're here for peace and love and happiness, and they're just being nice. But her gut instinct is absolutely correct. They should not be laughing that hard over shit that isn't funny. Uh, they should not be pressuring each other to behave like a studio audience. But she's already, already talking herself out of her gut instincts because she doesn't want to be rude. That, by the way, is how, anyway, I don't know how dark I want to get but I read a self-defense book that says you can literally save your life if you're not afraid of being rude. Um, there were plates of unappetizing pink spam laid out on the table and she eyed it hungrily, but just as she thought they might be allowed to attack it, a woman's voice began to say a prayer in a marked French accent. I'm not going to do a French accent. I'm just going to read how she spelled it. <laughs> Feeling such love for you, Heavenly Father, and for every other. F Heavenly Father, we are so many nations, Father, yet we can live in harmony and <laughs> peace as one, Father. <laughs> yep, I grew up hearing so many accents. All my best friend's parents were from Japan. Like moms, anyway, were from Japan. There was another family I grew up with whose father was from Italy. Another couple parents who were from, like, France and Belgium. So I grew up with, like, this cacophony of accents and I've heard them all pray and I've heard them all mispronounce my name with a th and father with a th oh boy it was a funny urgent little prayer that went on and on her voice was breathy and monotonous like someone blowing faintly down a pipe the deity was invoked at least three times per sentence as though the addressed one might otherwise lose concentration and wander off to get his slippers like some senile old gent Dude, I've heard these prayers so often. <laughs> they have to say Father and Heavenly Father all the time. It's always Heavenly Father or Father God, right? Because you're a family. That's why the ha it, there's a house mother, right? Because you worship the true parents. So everyone's a family and everyone is your brother and sister. And you have to win bonus points like you're playing a pinball machine by saying Father, 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 Father as many times as you can per sentence. Oh boy. Carmen squinted furiously as if she was praying too, but since she didn't believe in God, she felt rather a fraud. After a while, she lifted her head and took the opportunity to squint fuzzily at Gary while he was vulnerable and in repose and available for objects, objective study. Yeah, you end up checking people out while they're praying because you know everybody's eyes are supposed to be closed. <laughs> His brow was fiercely puckered, and he looked like someone with a migraine, but even that couldn't mar the symmetry of his perfect features. Okay, girl. <laughs> with his dark hair and well-defined bone structure, he was very good-looking, in a corny sort of way. <laughs> and she thought again that he might have modeled for a shop window dummy if he hadn't chosen to be whatever he was in the One World family. 
this is gonna, I, why do I feel like this is turning into a Wattpad, like erotic fiction? <laughs> I, okay, I'm, I'm gonna know this author is on some bullshit if she has a sex scene. Although with my other second gen speaking out, apparently people did get molested and have sex all the time. Who knows? This could turn into a very different live stream. Let's see how this goes. <clears throat> if it's not a religion, then why does everyone have to pray? She asked him innocently as she shoveled up the bland pink chunks of pork. No one has to pray, he shrugged. It's up to the individual. There's a lot of different religions here. Some people like to pray before a meal. It's good to respect other people's views, don't you think? He looked at her with his polite, inquiring air, waiting for her to agree. Oh, you see what he did there? He's already shutting down her want to ask more questions by flipping it around on her and basically implying like, well, if you don't pray, are you being disrespectful to everybody else who wants to pray? What he's neglecting to mention is that it is mandatory to pray because this is a religion, very much so. So he's using heavenly deception to say that they're not a religion, acting like they don't require everyone to pray. And then just like, don't you want to be respectful of other people's beliefs? Like, if you want to be immune to cult indoctrination, you got to be okay with being real fucking rude. You got to be okay with being kind of a bitch and letting people be upset with you. That's the key. That's how I broke out is by being that bitch. Um, yes, said Carmen, but it's not a church and it's not a political or if it's not a church and it's not a political organization, what is it? A sort of God fearing youth club without the ping pong. Once it was out, it sounded, it sounded rather flippant and awful, but she'd been trying to get a clear answer out of him for the length of the coach journey. Every time he'd come near to answering her questions, the coach had erupted into fresh song. And that's the purposes of song sessions and chores and lectures is so that you don't have time to mingle and ask important questions. I suppose that pretty well sums it up, he said, without appearing to give the matter much thought. But it's not a heavy thing. People don't try to force their views on you. <laughs> it's very easygoing, a bit like holiday camp, really. And you're the red coat, she asked doubtfully. This much, this has to be a British people reference because I don't get it. Yes, I'm your personal entertainment manager, he answered easily. So you b just better enjoy yourself. He smiled his lazy smile that was both warm and disarming. Carmen looked at him just a fraction too long. Whenever he smiled at her, she got a shock. Okay, we get it. You think he's cute. You got the hots for Gary. <laughs> Maybe it was because he spent so much time avoiding her eyes. But when he did choose to look at her, his gaze was so direct and searching that she was glad when he looked away again. <laughs> What's more, his eyes were startlingly blue and strange. She found that sometimes it was impossible to concentrate on what he was saying because she was so busy trying to analyze what exactly was so strange and compulsive about them. It was at those moments that she began to wonder if she wasn't just a little in love with him. To wonder whether the small agitation in her chest was not entirely to do with the fear of the unknown. As far as Carmen knew, there was no other explanation as to why it should be so disorienting to look into another person's eyes. Now, as he continued to regard her, she suddenly became acutely conscious of how she must look to him. She had scragged her thin, fair hair back into a scrimpy pigtail, and she could sense that sprouts of it were sticking out absurdly beh from behind her ears, and that her ears were too prominent and burning red like a schoolboy's. At best, she found herself pale, slight, and insignificant looking, but now she was pink with the heat and her upper lip glistened with sweat. Yet Gary continued to appraise her with frank admiration. She looked away from him, confused. She had, she had met him only three or four times, in cafes mostly, and once at the communal London house. Each time he'd afforded her the same degree of intimate concentration, as if she was the only person in the room, the only person in the world. For that reason, she felt inclined to trust him, and for the same reason, she didn't trust him one little bit. I hope she's ex gonna expand on this. There's a Vice documentary that I added to a playlist on my YouTube channel called Moonies in the News, where Dr. Steve Hassan explains that they were trained to stare three inches into someone's soul. 
So she's accustomed to getting eye contact when someone fancies you. What he's doing is trying to penetrate her soul with his gaze. So yeah, her reaction makes sense. It makes people really uncomfortable. That's the point, is to make you hyper-conscious of your own soul's presence and completely disregard your physical appearance. Ooh, uh, the war's over. You're safe now. <laughs> What's the pillow? <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, okay. At the end of the meal, he wandered off in search of a form for her to sign. She noticed almost subliminally that people treated him with a certain deference as he wove his way about the room, and she would have needed to be wiser than she was not to find this constant attention flattering. There you are, he said when he got back to her. Perhaps you could fill it in straight away. They need them for the office work. He stood over her with a paternalistic air as she filled out her details. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he met her several times and witnessed to her in coffee shops, and now he's, like, assigned to her. And they're going to be checking in with him during staff meetings. I, this is my prediction right now. She's going to be told what her bedtime is. She's going to be secluded with other sisters. And he's going to go to staff meetings, and they're going to check in, and he's going to be checking in on her progress. And he's going to be, like, the person assigned to her to, like, ask her questions about what she understands. And she doesn't get that yet. She doesn't. That's why he is acting very paternalistically because they literally call you their, your, the person who recruits you is your spiritual parent. So paternalistic is the perfect word. Mostly they were normal, the normal sort of questions. And she filled in Carmen Stone, age 20, religion, not really, occupation, art student, Jesus Christ, just like my mom, in her best italic hand. At the bottom of the page, the questions became more informal and chatty. To, do you ever despair of the state of the world? She cheerfully filled in, sometimes, but her pen faltered over the last one. Are you searching for something? Her eyes rested for a moment on the blob of fresh black ink poised on the gold nib. She looked up questioningly at Gary. What should I be searching for? I can't answer that for you, he smiled. We find a lot of people who come here are searching for something. Maybe they don't even know what it is. Carmen knew that she, what she was searching for, all right. She firmly wrote yes, and almost immediately, before she could read the small print at the bottom and discover what she'd signed, Gary was folding up the form. Ain't that always how it goes? She could hardly demand it back, insist on scrutinizing the thing minutely as though it was a crooked insurance policy. Actually, you could, just saying, probably would be a good idea, but you're already being pressured into being polite. <clears throat> so she said nothing and merely watched him as he put it in his pocket, hoping fervently that she hadn't just signed away her badminton racket, her single premium bond, and her banal but fairly happy little life. Psych, you did. Perhaps you'd like to see your room now, he asked gently. Pamela's taking people up. When she nodded, he got up hastily and moved around her to pull the chair out with the kind of old world courtesy that seemed to be second nature to him. Hella flashbacks. Pamela was a small, sharp-faced girl who looked harassed and self-important with responsibility. She wore the peasant kerchief that many of the girls affected, but from her white eyelashes and freckles, it was plain her hair was red. She wore an unflattering matronly dress that hung limp and shapeless on her small spare frame. She was no more than 18, and her bare legs were stick-like and splodged with brown freckles, ending in large childish sandals. She looked like a small child wearing a grown-up's dress, but her air was one of distracted authority, as though she was concentrating very hard, and there was something middle-aged about her manner as she flourished her clipboard and called out the names. She reminded Carmen of something between a determined, highly responsible sh social worker and a neurotic sheepdog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that impression was confirmed as she worried the females into the hallway and up the sweeping staircase, keeping up a fearsomely jolly, jolly commentary on the history of the house and the delights of the forthcoming week's program. The light was fading now. The house was a labyrinth and the corridors both narrow and dark. 
The house used to be a convent, and these were the nuns' cells, she announced. As they passed, they all peered in at the string of bleak, inhospitable cubicles with nothing in them but bleak horsehair beds. Carmen was glad that they were striding past them. They looked so melancholy. But what with the decline of the Catholic Church, Carmen might have imagined it, but it seemed that Pamela gave a rather contented sniff. Yeah, we were always fucking hating on Christians and Catholics. <laughs> So what with Catholics being um, basic and outdated and on their way out because they suck, um, <laughs> the order declined and our founder bought the house. Our founder was capitalized. At the second landing, Pamela stopped and appeared to listen as if hearing an imperceptible whistle. Then as though in response to it, she split the group, group arbitrarily, siphoning off the main gaggle of female guests along a side corridor and leaving only Carmen and a tall, gormless, looking girl in a cowboy shirt and jeans to stare wanely around at the paneling. The moment the footsteps receded, the girl who had thus far looked exceedingly unpromising with her expressionless features and her gold rim glasses suddenly sprang into life. Are you a member? She hissed urgently. Animated, her features took on a startling sweetness and an almost comic book mobility. Suddenly she wasn't gormless at all. She was protecting her real personality by not participating. She's another newbie and she was stonewalling everyone until she realized she was with another new recruit. Oh my God. This is genius. <laughs> no, I'm a guest, Carmen muttered back. Thank God, said the girl. Do you smoke? Carmen nodded. She's confiscated my cigarettes, the girl said with a heavy, ironic nod at the departed Pamela. I came down from Northampton with her, but it's been seven hours. I mean, she's as sweet as anything, but frankly, I don't think she understands nicotine withdrawal. Carmen looked at her with fresh interest. The girl had short, shiny brown hair and green eyes that gleamed with intelligence behind the thick national health lenses. Her nose was tip-tilted and her mouth had a de deprecating twist to it that made her whole face lively. Look, said the girl, we'll just let her settle us in and then we'll slip around the back for a fag, eh? That's a slur in America. It's not a slur in the UK. Okay, I'm going to let it slide. <laughs> uh... Otherwise, we'll have to sing again, and to be honest, my lungs won't stand it. Found yourself a good one. Hang out with this one. Oh, I feel like... I feel like one or both of them is going to break and end up brainwashing the other. Ooh. Okay, Carmen assented swiftly. As Pamela swung out of the corridor towards them, Carmen was intrigued to note that the girl seemed to be slump and resume her former posture of dull, virtuous blankness. Have you two met? asked Pamela. Apparently Carmen's very talented at art, Jane, she said as she marched them up the next flight of stairs. You two should have a lot in common. She added to Carmen in explanation. Jane's very good at origami. Jane rolled her eyes expressively at Carmen. There's a film tonight about the family's enterprises and then a family evening, Pamela announced as they chased her up the corridor. They watched her buttocks jiggle self-importantly as she struggled gamely on, laden like a pack horse with their baggage, the bulk of which she refused to let them carry. Because she has to live for the sake of others, y'all. That's how it works. That's how her codependent ass earns her sense of self. Oh, God. As Carmen was to learn, the members were heroically self why did I even explain it? She was about to explain it. As Carmen was to learn, the members were heroically self-sacrificing, but the self-sacrifice usually demanded extraordinary forbearance on the part of its beneficiary. <laughs> when she reached the end of the corridor, Pamela waited for them to draw level with her. Then she threw open the door triumphantly and ushered them in with the modest pride of an estate agent displaying the best property on the firm's books. It's the nicest room she had. Oh, wait, it's the nicest room we have, she said proudly, and it's got the prettiest view of the garden. Carmen and Jane stared ahead of them with consummate dismay. Their eyes were drawn involuntarily up towards the ceiling where the bank of three-tiered crate wood bunks reared grim grimly to brush against polyesterine ceiling tiles, obscuring much of the light and giving the impression of some sort of inhumane veal-raising apparatus at a battery farm. The bunks were stacked so close together, there was hardly a hand space between them, and yet there were sleeping bags laid out in the gaps. In fact, sleeping bags covered every inch of floor space, all in different unpleasant colored nylon, giving the floor the look of a festival, 
variegated quilt. Yup. Umpteen people to a room. Wait until you get to live in a van and fundraise with each other. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's 25 people in here already, Jane protested aghast. Don't exaggerate, scowled Pamela. There's plenty of space. Oh, if you watch the recent Instagram live on my Instagram page, I talk about mental abuse and how uh, uh, invalidating people's emotion is a form of mental abuse. Don't exaggerate. That's, yep. Okay. Jane and Pamela exchanged hostile looks. Why, so there is, said Jane. And Carmen watched her as she picked her way over the bags to the open window and thrust her head out. My, it is a pretty view, her muffled voice came back, and there's a little ledge. Perhaps I'll put my bag out there. She leaned out even further and appeared to size up the outside wall. Yes, she cried gaily. It's okay, Pamela. There's space for my clock, and I can hang my soap bag from the drain pipe. Carmen laughed without meaning to. Pamela frowned, biting her lip, both vexed and hurt. Cult members don't understand sarcasm. Food for thought. I don't think that's a bit funny, Jane. Honestly, there's plenty of room. You know it's a push for space. She busied herself with climbing precariously to the top bunk, tossing down a bag and motioning to Carmen to throw her own up in its place. Won't someone mind? Asked Carmen lamely, watching as Pamela, having levered herself down, spread the displaced person's bag under the U-bend of the sink. Not at all, said Pamela briskly. There's something you'll find in the family. People enjoy giving things. Sacrifice is a very nice way to say you're welcome, don't you think? Then, with a very pointed look at Jane, people never grumble about trivial things here in the family. That's the great thing. It makes it so much nicer for everyone else when people don't grumble about every petty little thing. Passive aggression. <laughs> when you live in close quarters with people you don't know and don't have anything in common with and you can't leave you end up becoming the most passive aggressive person ever because conflict is too painful. And also you're not supposed to advocate for what you want. So you can only be passive aggressive. <clears throat> Jane was making an elaborate pantomime of laying out her bag in the single wardrobe. And since Carmen seemed to find this droll, Pamela made an effort to smile indulgently and hide her exasperation. Do you want to have a wash and brush up? She asked finally, her patience pushed to the limit by Jane disappearing inside the wardrobe and the, trying to close the door on herself. The bathroom's down the hall. They scampered off like co-conspirators with their toilet bags and toothbrushes, both determinedly entering, enter the in, entering into the Enid Blighton spirit. I don't know what that means, but I believe you. But what about all those rows and rows of rooms? Guessed Carmen as they ran. Who sleeps in those? No one, said Jane. Togetherness, you know. Isolation is of Satan and all that. Oh, boy. Carmen had no time to puzzle this out. As she leaned on the bathroom door, it burst open on a bewildering ar array of naked and semi-naked flesh. Sorry, she mumbled, but even as she withdrew, the door was flung open with hearty invitation, and they found themselves facing a girl with a face like a potato. <laughs> With a face like a potato, <laughs> who, who urged them into the crowded little room. There were two naked girls crouched in the bath, back to back, their limbs wet and rubbery, whilst another sister hosed them down to save water. <sighs> I'm not dissociating. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. <sighs> There were two at the sink and another perched on the lavatory with her dress hauled up, straining to evacuate her bowels without benefit of screen or curtain. It was this last girl who addressed them directly. Just arrived, she hailed them. Carmen nodded nervously and fixed her eyes on the plug hole of the sink. Hi, I'm Virginia. She gave a cheery smile and leaned forward enthusiastically from the toilet seat, although she didn't get up. Carmen said her name, grinning rather foolishly the while. She wondered if it was appropriate to shake hands, but decided that hygiene precluded it if propriety didn't. Virginia hauled a long lug of toilet paper noisily from the holder. I think this seven days is going to be the best one ever, she said. I helped choose the film program, and even, even if I do say it myself, they're the most terrific bunch of films. Yeah, you can tell she's in deep. Oh, God, that used to be me. 
Don't picture me on the toilet. Carmen nodded nervously and began to wash her hands, taking advantage of the fact that one of the girls was brushing her teeth so enthusiastically that she hardly ever spat into the basin. Wednesday's the greatest story ever told, and Thursday's the sound of music. To Carmen's surprise, they all began to shriek and twitter like many pink mice in a pantomime. Virginia got up and pulled the chain. Hey, let's sing, she said suddenly. And just as Carmen was about to put her toothbrush in her mouth, they broke into a song as though a cue had been given, all rolling their eyes soulfully and swaying from the hips. <sighs> do I read it or do I sing it? Oh my God. I'm on the top of the world looking down on creation and the only explanation I can find is the love that I found ever since you've been around. I'm not going to sing anymore. <laughs> okay. Unnerved, Carmen caught Jane's eye. As one, they zipped up their soap bags and piled out into the corridor where they collapsed into a giggling heap, helpless with laughter. Because life is great and everything is helplessly funny. After a while, they became aware of Pamela standing over them, frowning as they snorted and squeaked and held their stomachs. All freshened up, she asked, which only made them laugh more. Really, Pamela said with wary forbearance, you won't be able to get into the atmosphere at all if you're going to be silly. Carmen tried to stop laughing because she suddenly felt rather, rather sorry for Pamela with her worn, pinched little face, her red hands, and her worried air of duty. I bet you her mom is in the church. I bet you Pamela's mom is in the church. Okay. Pamela escorted them down like a self-righteous girl guide leader. The hall was beginning to fill for the evening film show, and she found them two seats beside the ancient projector. Now stay put, she said to Jane, because I'm watching you. Carmen wondered about this. Although it was said in a jocular tone, there was an unctuous air of authority in her voice which meant she intended to be obeyed joking but not joking so that if something someone takes it too seriously you can question them the film whirred into motion to tumultuous applause and there were sounds of overexcited anticipation more suited to a children's matinee Carmen half expected to see the members racing up and down the aisles and dropping ice creams down on each other's necks but there was there were no refreshments and concentration on the image was touchingly intense, considering the quality of the scratched and fuzzy print. The projector whirred in her ears like the beating of a pterodactyl's wings, almost obscuring the commentary. And whenever the film snapped, the audience broke into loud theatrical groans, which turned into cheers when the film slurred back into motion again. The film purported to be an information film about the family. It was very bland and boring and gave Carmen none of the information that she wanted. The quality was so poor that the primary colors glared from the screen, gaudy as boiled sweets. The images were of perfect roses in summer gardens and squirrel-like rodents, which she supposed were chipmunks, nibbling acorns. Interspersed with these were shots of smiling young family members with clipboards accosting passers-by smiling family members in boiler suits with smart matching dust carts leaning cleaning up Times Square, more smiling family members selling fish and ginseng from the family's business enterprises. <sighs> breathe, bitch, breathe. <laughs> okay. The commentary that competed with the lush maudlin strings of the background music continually returned to the theme that these idealistic young people were changing the world as though having a clipboard was an innately virtuous state of being. And the clipboard itself was a potentially explosive instrument for change. <laughs> well, what did you think of that? Asked Pamela as the lights went up. Carmen saw that she was beaming with pleasure and that her eyes were very shiny and alive. Wasn't it tremendous? Carmen was at a loss to answer her at the same pitch. She found Pamela's elation bewildering. The film had ranged from okay to quite dull. I thought it was really inspiring, said Jane. It was great. Carmen looked at her, surprised. There was no touch of irony in her voice, and she was holding Pamela's arm with a warm, intimate pressure. All around them, people were exclaiming in the same terms that it had moved them, that it had been inspirational and overwhelming. Just then, Carmen felt a playful pinch into the flesh of her ribs, and she looked up in time to catch Jane's wink. 
Okay, so she still, Jane still has her sanity so far. <laughs> Two seconds later, she and Jane were sauntering as casually as they could manage through the crowd of people and out of the door. They sat on the steps of the large house and watched their cigarettes glowing against the darkness. There were other little glimmers on the hedge road, which told of other guests who'd had the same idea. The singing began inside the house and drifted out on the evening air. Oh, it's just easier to agree, Jane was saying. You'll see. And why upset her? She's a really nice person. She doesn't get many pleasures. This whole thing's a one-way ticket as far as I can work out. But why is it? Puzzled Carmen. Jane shrugged. I don't know. I suppose they believe it. Believe what? Carmen pursued. Oh, well, said Jane vaguely. Whatever it is they believe, that's why I'm here, isn't it? To satisfy my curiosity. I mean, I've heard little bits. It was clear she didn't mean to share whatever it was she'd heard. But it doesn't hang together. You can't make sense of it, not without coming and doing the course. Anyway, you're supposed to get it in dollops, like a slow revelation. Otherwise, it doesn't work. What doesn't work? asked Carmen, her curiosity fired. The principle, as they call it. I used to be a divine principle lecturer. So this is interesting to read. The principle, as they call it, said Jane. It's so deep. You can't understand it all at once. They have to feed you milk and water before you go on to solid food, that sort of thing. In other words, you have to become increasingly self-deprived to keep continuing to act like you give a fuck. That's what that means. <clears throat> I don't want to give too many spoilers, though. A spoiler alert, they indoctrinate you into having blessed children like myself. <laughs> That's the ultimate spoiler. <laughs> She waved her hand dismissively as though this was all self-explanatory. It's a very profound revelation. Oh, okay. So Jane is drinking the Kool-Aid. Although I don't know if that's a term I should be using anymore because it's kind of insulting. She's just pretending to be sarcastic because she's still a smoker. And she's like relating to newbies. That's why she got partnered with Jane. Oh, this sucks. She blew some smoke rings with her snub nose tilted toward the moon. Toward the moon. They watched them rise against the inky blackness. Or so they say, she added. Interminably. And then, as though ashamed of her fleeting disloyalty, as though it was Carmen who'd been guilty of the uncharitable thought, but they're such nice people. They've been very good to me. I didn't have anywhere to stay and they offered me a bed. I was doing biology at Northampton and I freaked out a bit around exam time. Lost my place in the hall of residence and they took me in at their center. They were great. Then Pamela kept going on and on at me to come on the seven day. So I thought she looked at Carmen and her eyes were candid and clear. I could at least give them the benefit of the doubt and find out what it is they think is so important, you know. Carmen nodded. Yeah, that's how they get you, is needing food or water. That's how they got my dad. My dad was, like, sleeping on the side of the road because he just committed fraud and was running from the cops and having, like, a bipolar manic episode and, like, a psychotic break. He spent a few days institutionalized and called his sister in Oregon, but his sister couldn't really do anything from another state, so he ended up joining the Moonies because he needed friends and a place to live and people who would accept him no matter how fucking weird he was. Carmen nodded. I suppose there are centers all over the place, Carmen inquired artlessly. It occurred to her that there might be a list of centers somewhere, maybe even a list showing which members were in what centers. If so, maybe Lucy's name would be upon it. Supposing, just supposing there was a list, she could get into the office and lay her hands on it. She was eyeing Jane speculatively and wondering if the girl might be a future ally. Jane nodded indifferently. All over the country, all over the world. It doesn't seem a bad life, she reflected, as if she were considering it as a viable career alternative to life in a bank or the women's metropolitan police. They're incredibly warm and kind, and there's a lot of foreign travel. Except, well, it takes a lot of commitment. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. I couldn't really commit myself without knowing what I was committing myself to. She said it rather apologetically, as though it was Carmen who was pressing her, as though she needed reassuring that her cautious attitude was not unreasonable. Carmen hesitated before she spoke. You don't think there's something, well, 
odd about them? She added, she asked delicately. The members, I mean. You know, the way their eyes fog over when they're talking. Jane looked at her mildly surprised. Odd, she echoed distantly. Odd. And she laughed a very healthy peal. Look, Carmen, they're completely barmy. You'd better get that through your head or you'll be out selling one world in San Francisco come Tuesday week. Oh, my God. Just as Carmen was digesting this sudden turnabout, Jane began to tug insistently at her sleeve. Watch out, she hissed. Here's yours. So, yeah, that's interesting. Is like, you can tell Jane is on the fence, and the more she talks to church members, the more she agrees with church members, and the more she talks to Carmen, who's an outsider, the more she agrees with outsiders. And she knows that Gary is assigned to her, and that's the first time that Carmen has understood that, like, oh, Gary's assigned to take care of me. Startled, Carmen looked up the porch where Gary stood in the lights, in the light spill, frowning, because they're smoking. Pamela appeared just behind him. As Gary's eyes settled on Carmen, a broad smile snapped onto his face. Oh, spooky. And he mooched casually down the steps toward the truants. Hey, there you are, he called amiably. We've been looking for you. You'll miss out on all the fun if you're not careful. There's some cocoa coming. Carmen smiled trustingly up at him as he loomed closer. We'll be right with you, Gary, she promised, as soon as we finish our cigarettes. Well, don't be long, wavered Pamela, her face anxious. Everyone's getting to know each other and having a good time in here. With that, Gary and Pamela turned back towards the house. Carmen was still smiling when she looked back at Jane. It had been a warm smile, the kind that took a little longer to fade. Jane noted how it lit up Carmen's face, and she sniffed suspiciously. Is he your spiritual father? she asked, nodding at Gary's retreating back. Since Carmen only looked blank, she pressed on. Is he the one taking care of you, the one who found you? Does he stick to you like a lovelorn shadow? Carmen hesitated. Was that it? Was Gary actually required to treat her like a very special piece of porcelain? Girl, you thought. <laughs> uh, and this is why I drink. This is why I have trust issues, because none of your relationships are real. <laughs> People are assigned to you. <sighs> uh, I sort of found him, she said flatly, and she drew her, drew hard on her cigarette. Yeah, okay, girl. <laughs> Whatever you need to tell yourself. <laughs> Jane continued to look at her with expectant interest. There was a whole load of them on the edge edgeware edgeware road teaching things from blackboards in the rain. I started talking to him. I was curious. She lied. The truth was that she hadn't just happened upon them. She had sought them out. The officer at the missing person bureau had warned her to leave well alone, but she couldn't. Every word of the letter was etched on Carmen's brain. The bland phrases, so stilted, so uncharacteristic of Lucy, and the initials ITPN above the miserable squiggle of Lucy's signature. It hadn't been possible for her to leave well alone. And then I asked so many questions, he took me to his center. Jane's eyes widened in surprised appreciation. Apparently, that's unusual, Carmen said in an offhanded way. Unheard of, Jane agreed. It's usually them going on and on at you. Yes, Carmen got to her feet, uneasy with the conversation. Well, I must be an unusual sort of person or something. Apparently, it means I've got good ancestors. Ah. <sighs> The first thing my mom asks people when they come into her house is, who are your ancestors? Apparently, it means I've got good ancestors. She laughed flippantly at the idea. Good taste, more like, said Jane, scrambling after her. All I've got is that miserable Pamela hanging around my neck like an albatross, snapping all my Rothams in half. <laughs> She's like, at least you got a cute spiritual father. Together, they made their way into the house where the communal singing was winding down to an emotional ending. It's always a fucking concert that needs like a meaningful song at the end. As the applause broke out, the cocoa urns were portentously wheeled in like ceremonial samovars. I don't know what that means. And everyone began to mill about at random in great 
good humor, chatting and making friends. Gary was immediately at her side, confiding two chocolate bourbon biscuits into her hand as though they were somehow very precious. Pamela whirled Jane off to a corner and seemed to be administering some private scolding. Uh, first of all, snacks are very precious because everyone there is broke as fuck. And Carmen stood alone, watching Gary as he weaved fluidly through the crowd toward the refreshment table. The situation reminded her of something between a church social and a village hall and an 18th century pump room, and she realized then why she felt so lighthearted. After all, no one was going to steal her soul, and there was no denying that if Gary wanted to dance attend on her, was, was maybe even required to dance attendance on her, then there was no law against her getting some innocent pleasure from it. As it was, she couldn't help but notice, as he was caught in conversation with Matthew in the scrum, he kept darting nervous glances at her, as though to fix exactly where she was, rather like, well, rather like a desperate man at a race course with all his money on one dog. That's exactly what it is. You might be his first spiritual child, and he constantly has to report to Matthew how his new person is doing. So, keen observation. She felt again the uneasy sensation that there was something secretive going on behind his eyes, that he was contemplating tactics in some hidden compartment of his brain. <clears throat> I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> it's okay, I'll, uh, I'll save this. Um, if you missed the beginning. When Gary had threaded his way back with polyesterine cups of lukewarm cocoa, he placed himself quite close to her and spoke in an undertone that was confidential and intimate, as though they stood alone in the crowded room. You should talk to as many people as you can, he told her. That's what the family's all about, making a lot of friends. It's good to get to know lots of people, not just one. Jane's nice, but she's not the only person here. Ooh, they taught me how to do this at my sales job that I sort of cult hopped to after being a Mooney. Um, you don't let new people mingle with each other because they'll cane each other out. And that's not like a cool cocaine term. That's just like they'll talk each other out of it the same way that Carmen sort of snapped Jane out of joining the cult for a second. <clears throat> I like her, said Carmen, surprised at herself. She had not expected to like anybody. She had meant to keep herself to herself like a spy, somehow thinking that would be safer. But now it occurred to her that it would be comforting to have an ally. I thought she was quite amusing. Oh, well, amusing, Gary repeated with a hint of a sneer, as though to be amusing was no particular accomplishment. You strike, you strike me as being someone that's quite spiritually open. Because having spiritual powers is a compliment and something that everyone strives to do in the Moonies. Is that good? asked Carmen, disconcerted. He nodded gravely, his eyes searching her face. It's good, but if you spend all your time with Jane, who has, well, rather erratic spirits, she waited with a quizzical expression on her face, and he thought better of his speech. He smiled with a self-deprecating candor. Oh, well, I suppose what I mean is, I'd like to spend more time with you myself. There's so many things we have to talk about. So much I want to ask you about your life. A week isn't very long to get to know each other deeply. Carmen colored, wondering how deep... He wanted to go. And then this turned into 50 shades of gray, <laughs> wondering what on earth else there was to tell him. How much did he think he'd packed, she'd packed into her 20 years? She told him about her family and her background. She'd even told him about Lucy vanishing, although he hadn't seemed to want to know. About Robin and art school and her long line of ill-starred cats. He, on the other hand, had managed to tell her virtually nothing about himself. He continued to stare at her with a brooding intensity, as though he believed there was some dark mystery that only he could penetrate. <laughs> they said penetrate. Yeah, he says he thinks that she's spiritually open because she sought him out, and every Mooney is obsessed with the idea that Reverend Moon is the, the way, the truth, and the light, and that anybody who takes warmly to a Mooney missionary must be spiritually open. Like, oh, they know. They know that Moon's the Messiah and their good ancestors are driving them to get to know us better. Their good ancestors are influencing them to make a good decision and become a Mooney because we were the ones who've got it right. Uh, and he's waiting for her to break is what's happening. He's waiting for her to let go of her personality and just become a cyborg who just repeats everything and smiles and laughs at everything. 
<clears throat> well, ask me then, she said, self-consciously, aware that she was batting her eyelids outrageously. He studied her face for a long moment, and she sensed that what he saw there dissatisfied him. Because he's not supposed to flirt. No, he said reluctantly, now's not the time. We'll talk tomorrow. You have too big a crush on me. That's what he's thinking. People were beginning to disperse now, making their way out of the hall towards their beds. I just want, I just want you to know, he said, that we're, we didn't meet by accident. There's a connection between us that's very strong and important. We were meant to meet. And with that cryptic statement, he said his courteous goodnights and made abruptly for the door, leaving her bewildered in the middle of the floor to stare thoughtfully into the chocolate sludge at the bottom of her disposable cup. The guitar player was moving around the room, serenading the groups of remaining guests with a firm go-to-bed song. It wasn't long before Pamela arrived and herded Carmen out with the other sisters up the staircase for the long walk to the dormitories. And that's chapter one fit almost exactly into an hour. Glad to see my microphone works. I will probably continue doing this until I finish the book. There are 11 chapters. I have, listen, I have had so many long nights of cheap, nasty Nestle cocoa powder in styrofoam cups. You can take it from me, an actual certified I second gen fresh off uh, the hive mind. This is freakishly accurate. Um, I feel very exposed. Thank you for joining me. Um, I am almost terrified to read what else happens. But yeah, I just think this is really fun. I just think it's like, I'm glad I can give an insider's perspective and add additional commentary. And I thought it was really cool that I sort of foreshadowed the spiritual father thing. It's just, it's so cool being validated instead of people looking at me like I'm insane and not knowing any of the terms and then here they are in a book. Um, hello, I'm actually about to sign off, but this, I'll keep this up on my page and um, I'll probably do this more, once a week or more. Cause I got, Lord knows we got shit all else to do in this panorama rama panini okay everyone uh keep it real you can watch this back it was sort of a surprise live that i didn't prep people for i'll schedule the next one if you want to be there for from the beginning for um chapter two bro you're also next movie this is crazy watch this back if you don't have the book it's not it's so accurate it's like painfully accurate yeah so i'll schedule the next one and we can read chapter two Chapter two, hilariously, is a term in the church also. Uh, yes. <laughs> this is great. I was also thinking of, on my YouTube channel, reacting to um, the movie Ticket to Heaven that was made in the 70s or 80s that is now on YouTube for free in its entirety. I think that would be fun. Um, but, yep. <laughs> yes. You were meant to catch this live. We were meant to meet each other because <laughs> you have good ancestors. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta go take a walk and splash cold water on my face. Holy shit. Okay, I'll see you all next time. <laughs>